Professor Nidal Rasung is an Algerian astrophysicist who received his MSc and PhD degrees from the University of California at San Diego and spent two years thereafter as a postdoctoral researcher at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. His research focuses on gamma radiation, mainly from the Milky Way galaxy, but lately from other sources in the universe as well. He has had a long-term collaboration with colleagues at the Institut de Recherche en Astrophysique et Planétologie in Toulouse, France. 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 He has been at the American University of Sharjah, at the UAE, of course, uh, just north of Dubai, for the past 15 years, where he has served as chair of the physics department, associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and president of the faculty senate. In addition to his technical papers, he has published dozens of articles on general science issues, edited two conference proceedings volumes, and written several books in Arabic, French, and English, including Islam's Quantum Question, Reconciling Muslim Tradition, and Modern Science, which was published with I.B. Taurus uh, in 2011. And that is really, I think, the background of, uh, of the subject he's going to talk to us today about. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nidal Rasoum. Good evening. Thanks so much, Phil, for the very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be counted as one of the friends of NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, this impressive institution which uh, has enriched the academic and cultural, educational background and landscape of the UAE. Um, there will be almost no astrophysics today, almost. Um, but the topic for today is really about how Islam has reacted and interacted with modern science. I will define later what I mean by modern science and in what way is modern science different from just science, especially the old science. Um, but before we get to the modern science and the relations between Islam and modern science, which hopefully you will find quite interesting and diverse, I need to go back a little bit uh, to some history and some background into the Islamic tradition and into the Islamic civilization and Islamic history, not for history's sake, nor certainly not for any nostalgic reasons, but because I hope I will be able to identify a few principles that um, even Muslims, actually the overwhelming majority of Muslims would not would not be aware that those principles have been brought up and developed in the Islamic uh, civilization. And those principles, uh, I hope to show that they will be very useful in developing a more fruitful and constructive relationship with modern science. Um, science slash knowledge, the reason why I use this slash is because in the Arabic vocabulary, the word for both science and knowledge is ilm. And the ilm has this very uh, diverse, sophisticated, complex uh, set of meanings and connotations. And that leads to sometimes some misunderstandings. But just for the time being, we're just keeping that as science slash knowledge. Uh, so we begin in the Islamic tradition, we always begin with the, the reference, the book, uh, people's some, some scholars have defined Islam as a tradition or a religion or a civilization grounded in a book. And so we always look at the book and what does the book, the Quran, say about knowledge, etc. And we find, of course, this um, um, stressed encouragement to pursue knowledge, to pursue exploration, to try to understand the world around us. Um, many commentators have, have mentioned that there are up to 750 Quranic verses out of about 6,000. So that's one eighth of the book that are devoted to discussing or mentioning natural phenomena. So nature plays a certain role in the Islamic worldview and the pursuit of understanding of nature and the, and the contemplation, there is this, this concept of contemplating uh, and understanding there is the idea of awe and reflection is very much a leitmotiv and the theme in the Quran. 
Uh, I want to move a bit fast on this because there will be quite a bit more later, especially on the modern science front. Uh, we likewise find some statements from the Prophet himself, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or from the general tradition of the Islamic culture and civilization. And so, as I mentioned, you can read some of the statements here that I have selected. The idea of contemplation, study of nature, being better than a year's adoration of God. I mean, this, if anything, is a very striking statement. The ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. God put out there a cure for every disease he created, meaning go and find it, etc., etc. Um, in addition to those statements which have encouraged Muslims to pursue science and knowledge, there have been in the Islamic religion itself a number of practices that have almost dictated or required developments in the sciences. So, for example, prayer times and the direction of Mecca has uh, very soon required the development of spherical trigonometry. And so people developed some sophisticated methods for calculating prayer times in different places and determining the direction of Mecca from different locations. Likewise, the calendar, the Islamic calendar, determining particularly the um, religious months, if you like, the months of Ramadan, the months of Dhul Hijjah for Hajj, for pilgrimage, etc., uh, required people to try to figure out, okay, so what do we know about the appearance of the new crescent? Uh, can we predict it? Uh, what does it depend on? Obviously, some astronomy, but also some meteorology, uh, etc., etc. And so that developed also some science and people developed criteria, some of which remained valid up to and well into the 20th century, the criteria for determining when would the new crescent be seen, meaning when would Ramadan presumably begin, etc., etc. And also in some other areas of science, in mathematics, for example, um, most people know that al-Khawarizmi uh, put, didn't really develop or, or invent, as sometimes it's said, the science of algebra, but certainly put it on a very firm footing and put it in this compendium, this Kitab al-Jabr wal muqabala the book in which he laid out the, the rules for doing algebra. And in the first few pages, uh, al-Khawarizmi uh, starts to explain that I am laying out here for you a new way of doing mathematics because these new ways, I believe, are very useful in uh, worldly affairs, meaning in your commerce, in calculating things, etc., but also in your religious life. And so he gives the example of alms, the zakat, uh, which is the amount of money that people are supposed to give out of their savings every year, etc. And so he says, he gives this example, and he says, if a woman, for example, dies and she has a sum of money or she has an asset and she has three children, uh, two girls and, and, and a boy, and she has a debt, and how do you calculate? And he says, okay, here's how you, you do it. And by the way, the way he, you do it is what we today would call an algorithm, you know, sort of a set of rules. And the word algorithm, of course, is, comes directly from uh, al-Khawarizmi. But in any case, so he lays it out, and then he says, okay, let's generalize now. And that's how uh, this algebra begins. So the point, the point is there have been certain practices in the Islamic uh, religion and tradition that have... Uh, incentivized have led to further developments in the sciences, in astronomy, in mathematics, and in other fields. Um, in addition to that, there have been some institutions of science, and I'm just going to go very briefly over this. The madrasas, which lately have acquired a bad connotation, but madrasa simply means religious school, and religious schools weren't really schools of science. The curricula were not really strong on science, but they had to have, in most cases, some uh, introductory material on the sciences, because as I said, people had to understand uh, these issues that have to do with science uh, that come from the core of the uh, Islamic practice itself. Then there were these universities, and Qarawiyin in Fez is, is usually considered the first, the oldest, uh, at least the oldest still running university in the world, and others, Al-Azhar Nizamiya in Iraq and, and other places like that. Um, but other places of learning where science was developed are the houses of wisdom. The one in Baghdad is the most famous, where translation and research and discussions were going on. And also, what I personally consider, maybe I'm a bit biased, certainly I'm a bit biased, uh, astronomical observatories are some of the greatest contributions of the Islamic civilization to the human heritage. 
um, for example, the one in Samarkand or the one in Maraha, etc., which had, of course, when we say uh, observatories, uh, in those days, they did not include telescopes. The telescopes were invented only in the uh, early 17th century. And we're talking here about um, observatories like this. So th this, is, this, this one is in New Delhi, actually. Uh, was built in the 17th or 18th century, and as you can see, is really an old style that does not have a telescope, etc. Um, but in any case, and, and that is the famous painting of the Istanbul Observatory, which was built in 1577. So that tells you how long and how uh, diverse these uh, institutions of science uh, were. So in any case, there were some instruments, non-telescopic, non-optical, uh, naked eye um, instruments that were absolutely huge. In some cases, you know, diameter of 80 meters. Uh, some fantastic, fantastic work that was done in there. And there have been a regain in interest in uh, the whole topic of Islam and science, the history at least. A number of books, uh, many of them published, or most of them actually published in, in the West. Uh, this lost history one is not a very good one, I have to say. But the reason I put it up there is because it symbolizes the reason why these books have appeared in the last 10 years. It's because suddenly people realize that there, is, there has been a lost history. That, oh, wait a minute, there has been this thousand year gap that the history of science has, seems to have ignored. And people talk about, you know, they jump from Ptolemy to Copernicus. Uh, there's a 1200 year uh, gap or jump. And so people have written about this, okay, what happens? Uh, actually, this one, Light from the East, is one of the best, very, very simple and very brief. Um, anyway, so people who are interested in the history of Islam and science can look up some of these books and maybe others. Now, here's the part that I am really mostly interested in when we look at the past and the history. What I am interested in is the, what we today call philosophy of science. So how did Muslim thinkers understand science and what did it tell them about worldview, about theology, about God, about action, causality, things like this. And there's a number of them, and it would take me a whole hour just to go over these, because these are really fascinating, but I'll just give you a very brief overview of some of these. For example, the Mu'tazilites, uh, the Mu'tazilites are, of course, a school of theology, Kalam, uh, widely described as the rationalists or rationalistic school of theology. And uh, as pertains to science, uh, they start with theological principles. So for example, one of their main theological principles is the absolute justice of God. That's actually the second principle of the Mu'tazilites, the first one being divine unity. So the second one right away is God is absolutely just. And if God is absolutely just, then there must be free will, according to them. And if there must be free will, then there must be causality in the world, because I cannot be free to do, I must be free to do what I want to do if God is going to judge me and reward me or punish me. And if I am free to do what I want, then the world has to react to any action I want to undertake. So if I want to push this or I want to uh, do something for one person or another, then it must be uh, affected. I mean, it must be carried out. So the world has to have causality. One. Number two, and as you can see, so we're starting from theology, and then we start talking about causality and how the world works. Number two, um, the world has to have some regularity, which means uh, what we today call uh, laws of nature, sometimes known as laws of science, but laws of nature. Uh, why is that? Because how would I know that if I do this, here's what's going to happen? So I can plan for my action, and my action then has a consequence. How I know that is because I have seen this before, I have experienced it, I, has, I have tested it, and so I know that the world has regularity. So because it has, passed like, it has worked like this in the past, then it has to work again the same way now. And so there is some regularity and there must be some laws of nature. And so the Mu'tazilites developed this sophisticated understanding of the world, simply starting from theological principles. Um, the Biruni Avicenna correspondence is one of the greatest correspondences in the history of medi medieval thought, Islamic or other. 
Uh, Biruni wrote to Avicenna, who was actually a little bit younger than him, but more famous, and said, Grandmaster, I actually have read your books, but I have some questions. Would you allow me to pose? And he sends him 18 questions. And when you read the questions, you find that most of the questions are actually physics questions. Why do you insist that all motions in the heavens have to be circular? Why do you think that there cannot be other worlds out there that are made of different material than our world is made? Why do you think that when water freezes, then it has to do this or it doesn't have to do that? And so after these exchanges, uh, the conclusion is one of the most um, uh, fantastic conclusions. Biruni writes to Avicenna and says, I think I understand the difference why we are in some disagreement. It is because I am a scientist and you are a philosopher. I am a scientist. I work in an inductive manner. I look at the world. I observe, and then I try to deduct some general laws. You essentially follow Aristotle, and so you start from philosophical principles or first principles, and you try to derive things in a logical manner. And he tells him, I don't think that's the way the world functions. It doesn't function according to the first principles that we have set. Anyway, there are a number of things like this in the history of, of the Islamic civilization. I have just mentioned a few of them. Ibn Rushd, my hero, Ibn Rushd Averroes uh, insisted on causality. And he said, and this, of course, was a long debate. Uh, is there absolute causality in the world, what people, philosophers call secondary causality, or is all causality related to God? Of course, the dominant theological school, the Ash'arites, which nowadays is almost absolutely dominant, um, insists that everything relates to God. And so every time anything happens, it is God that has acted. And the Mu'tazilites and the philosophers argued opposite to that. They were saying, no, God has put together a world according to certain laws and according to certain principles, and actions, processes, uh, phenomena that occur in the world occur according to these laws. So there is secondary causality. It is, of course, God that is behind all this, but God doesn't act every time we do something. So Ibn Rushd insists on causality, and in replying to Al-Ghazali, a century later, uh, says, if we give up causality, then we give up knowledge altogether. We cannot do science, essentially. He didn't use the word science, but essentially he was telling him, we cannot do science if we do not insist and abide by uh, absolute causality in the world. So these things, you will see later why I'm insisting on these ideas, even though this is a thousand years removed. Um, Ibn al-Haytham, I think I'll skip on this. Ibn al-Haytham, um, we can consider Ibn al-Haytham, al-Hazan, as he's known in the West, as the first modern scientist. I have a long quote here from Jim al-Khalili, who in January 2009 had this BBC series called uh, science and Islam, or Islam and Science, three-part series, and where he, you know, sort of presents Ibn al-Haytham as, you know, this is one of the greatest scientists of all time that most people in the West have never heard of. Uh, and he insists that not only was he the father of optics, but as in the quote that I highlight over here, Ibn al-Haytham is regarded as the father of the modern scientific method. Why does, Ibn, uh, why does Jim al-Khalil, I think this statement is a bit exaggerated, but why does he say that? He says that because Ibn al-Haytham uh, adopted a methodology that was thoroughly naturalistic. We'll come back to this. This will be one of the important themes of the lecture. What does it mean? We'll explain shortly later. But briefly, um, it means that when you're trying to explain any phenomena that occur in the world, you have to invoke only natural causes and you are not allowed to invoke divine or any super agents, supernatural agents. So that's one. And this is extremely important. Essentially, this is what will define modern science later. Uh, he also built an experimental methodology well before Roger Bacon. Uh, and he sought to determine laws to the phenomena, especially the optical phenomena that he was studying. And this is what we do. This is how we do science today. In all these three principles, this is exactly how we do science today. Um, Biruni, I'll skip on Biruni, I've told you briefly. But Biruni is a bit different from Ibn al-Haytham, also highly rigorous, 
methodological, and I've mentioned this discussion and correspondence with uh, Avicenna. But the difference between Ibn al-Haytham and Biruni is Biruni was thoroughly religious. Ibn al-Haytham, when you read his work, you don't get the impression that he had, or at least he wasn't mentioning it at, at all. So his religion, whatever, how much faith he had or how much practice is unknown, is not written at all. But Biruni puts it out there. He says, I'll do my science rigorously, I'll check, and actually he faults Ptolemy for some values that he had removed. He says, you cannot do that, you are not allowed to do that. This is not ethically val uh, val um, valid. You cannot just remove some data just because you disagree with them or anything. So he's extremely rigorous. But at the same time, he says, this is all for the glory of God. This is, I, and he cites verses from the Quran and says, this is why I do science, and this is why I find you know, awe and, and satisfaction in doing this, etc. So the two are not contradictory. Now, then there was a long decline, and it would take also another hour to just explain what decline. When did the decline occur? That's a long debate among the historians. Essentially, well, the decline, when we talk about the decline, it depends on which field we're talking about. So in astronomy, it went on until at least the late 16th century. In medicine, it went on to at least the 17th or 18th century. In some other fields, it declined much faster. And why? Complex set of causes. Complex. I can mention some of them later during the discussion if you're interested, but as I said, we're interested in the modern times and the modern science. Jump to the present and just to allow myself this big historical jump, I just want to mention briefly this chapter in, um, in this book, Science and Religion Around the World, written by uh, Ekmel Adin Ihsan Oglu, who was until a year or two ago the Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, a high scholar of history of science from Turkey, and wrote this very interesting chapter on what happened during the Ottoman era, which is this period that I have skipped. So it, anyway, people who are interested in this can look at that. I just need some water if you'll allow me. And, uh, while I drink my water, I want, to put, I want to put the most important slide in my lecture, which is the challenge of modern science. Um, first of all, why do I say the challenge of modern science? Because when you talk to Muslims in general, almost invariably, they will say, what problem? Islam and science have always had a fantastic history. And they will mention what I just mentioned, and a lot more. Actually, I focused mostly on the philosophical, theological aspects that relate to science, but people can mention, you know, um, encyclopedia of, of all kinds of scientific works. So you see, we always had great science. We had, you know, hundreds of scientists. And why do you think that there is a problem between Islam and science? And I say, oh, no, 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 I didn't say there is a problem between Islam and science. I said, today, there is a problem between Islam and modern science. Not the same thing. I say, oh, well, so what do you mean? And what I mean is this. Modern science has introduced at, at least the first principle which I consider to be key, and the second one which I consider to be one of the pillars of modern science today, um, but not necessarily as um, significant. This first principle is what we refer to, what people refer to in philosophy of science as methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism means you accept to only cite natural causes to any natural phenomenon you're investigating. In other words, if you see somebody sick, you don't tell me, oh, there's a demon, or, uh, okay, we'll just, uh, we'll just uh, uh, hope that the angels will, uh, will uh, answer our prayers that we take care of it. That is not acceptable. I mean, you can believe it if you want, but that's not science. So... Uh, and you cannot say, oh, because God intervened and God did this. And so this opens up the whole debate of what do you mean by miracles? Are there miracles, etc.? So in any case, this changes the game, obviously. And so many, 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 an overwhelming majority. I just recently, a couple of months ago, we had a workshop over two days in Istanbul. And there were some high-level Muslim physicists who refused to accept it, this methodological principle. Uh, 
natural, uh, methodological naturalism. And I said, wait a minute, but show me any papers you've written in, in, in your entire career and where you, you did not abide by this. So whether you accept it or not, this is what you're doing. I'm sorry. Uh, show me any paper where you have invoked any supernatural agent, and then I will say, oh, okay, then you are at least self-consistent. But nobody does. Nobody does. Muslim or non-Muslim, everybody, uh, in effect, uh, abides by this. But when they sit and think about it and discuss it, then they say, hmm, wait a minute, so, so where's God in the picture now? Okay, so you've removed God. So are you telling me there is no God? Uh, I say, no, I'm not telling you there is no God. So, but God is not playing any role. Well, he's playing a role indirectly. Then we go back to the issues of secondary causation and is there causality in the world? Uh, how did God uh, make the world function? And then you have to go back. And that's why I said those ideas that were developed, which 99% of Muslims are unaware of, that were developed a thousand years ago, can become very, very useful in resolving these problems. The second one is this falsifiability, which most people accept uh, as a new defining principle of science, of modern science, that any proposed explanation that does not present ways of being tested is not scientific. So you can give me any idea, and then I say, how do you check that? How can I test that? And you say, oh, I don't think, I can't see how that can be tested. And I say, that's not in the realm of science. And then call it philosophy, call it art, whatever you like. Call it religion if you like, maybe. It comes from religion, but it's not science. So it has to be uh, falsifiable, meaning it, can be, it must be tested, it can be tested. Then there are the, ch the challenging theories and new paradigms, particularly evolution. That's why I put evolution in the title of the lecture. Both biological and human, certainly, most particularly, human evolution. And then there is cosmology, what I call 21st century cosmology, uh, slightly different from 20th century cosmology, because 21st century cosmology uh, has introduced some ideas that have not yet been, had, have become standard and widely accepted and part of the science, such as multiverse, such as the no, big ba no beginning, not no big bang, no beginning, pre-big bang, etc., which make people nervous. I don't see any problem with that whatsoever. I don't even see why people would be bothered if there is a multiverse. I don't see why people would be bothered if there was you know, uh, a pre-universe to our universe. But people are bothered because they got um, educated, uh, reared in a certain worldview, and anything that is different seems to them as if it is violating or rejecting the religious principles or the religious teachings that they have received. But evolution, I can certainly understand why people would be bothered. I am not, and I'll try to explain later, but um, that constitutes a challenging theory. So biological and human evolution, wide rejection today. Acceptance among scholars during the golden age. So I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And then, as I said, there's this 21st century cosmology, and I'll skip over that. Over that. Uh, this is 20th century cosmology until, until the turn of the century, essentially. This is how the universe evolved. There's a big bang, and then there's inflation, and then there's all this cosmic evolution. I tell people the, the, the reason why I like cosmology, this 20th, 20th, 20th century cosmology so much is because it embodies cosmic evolution. I say, so there's, there's been evolution throughout the history of the universe, including the formation of the solar system, the formation of the Earth, the evolution of the Earth, with its different phases of the atmosphere and the liquid water, etc., etc. So the whole universe is built on evolution. And then, but when it, gets, when it gets to biological evolution, in the later stages, in the last few days of the calendar, so to speak, then, you know, uh, all hell breaks loose. Um, so this is some of the evidence. I will not bore you with this. I said almost no astrophysics. Uh, but evolution in Islam, first of all, and people are very often surprised to hear this, and one can go on and on uh, giving all kinds of evidence to this. During the Islamic Golden Age, evolution for both animals and humans was discussed and accepted by a number of Muslim scholars, including Al-Jahiz, this zoologist, thinker, <laughs> Mu'tazilit, by the way, uh, Ikhwan al-Safa ibn Khaldun, the great historian and sociologist, and others. There's even a beautiful and famous poem by Rumi describing the evolution of man from inanimate matter through plants and animals. Okay, people say, well, that was a poem. I mean, okay. 
it's a poem and it's you know Sufi and you know it's, it's, it can, anything goes there but um, at least for him it was a very very accepted idea and he imagined that we are in the end the result of this huge evolution starting from inanimate matter not only that but in the poem uh, he explains that we actually remember some of our earlier stages very beautiful poem if you can just look it up it's in my book if I can plug it plug that in um, now Darwin's work 1859 so I've skipped from the golden age to what happened with Darwin, was first received quite open-mindedly. Not necessarily all accepted, you know, like, oh yeah, thank you very much, no problem. Uh, but open-mindedly, people discussed, people read, uh, critiqued, replied, and said, yeah, some of it is not quite convincing, but some of it seems okay, and if that gets confirmed, then that's not a problem. Remember, I'm talking here about late 19th century early 20th century, when the evidence for evolution was nowhere near as strong as it is today. And still, people did not just necessarily reject it and did not reject it on religious grounds. Today, there is much misunderstanding of evolution. A lot of people don't understand you know, what evolution does and says. Um, however, I firmly uphold that evolution and all valid science, not just about evolution, it's all about any valid science, can be reconciled with Islam and religion, religion in general. But this requires a little bit of intelligent rethinking of some concepts and even of some theological principles. So, for example, uh, one needs to reconceptualize the idea of creation. What does it mean that God created? Uh, who are we? What does human mean? Are we separate from the rest of all nature? Are we completely different? Uh, are we, uh, do we share no history with the rest of nature? So that requires a little bit of rethinking. Who was Adam? This is a constant leitmotiv in the Islamic and all religious discourse. So you say people, when you explain to them, you know, the whole grand epic of evolution, they invariably turn around and say, so where's Adam in all that? Who was who he and where, when did he appear? And so this requires a little bit of rethinking and, and repackaging, so to speak. Um, but I think that considering humans as fully connected to the rest of nature under a grand divine plan can indeed be a potent and deep theological viewpoint. So I think there is, and actually it's very interesting that um, in the second edition, second and later editions of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, the last sentence he says, I think in this, meaning in what I have presented, this evolutionary uh, paradigm, there is a new, there is grandeur, he says, grandeur in, and, and in seeing the work of the creator. And that's how he concludes it. He says, actually, I don't see why anybody would be bothered. If anything, it is very impressive. It's, as I said, it's a big epic. So Islam and evolution can in fact be a win-win proposition both for theology and for the uh, science and education. Now, um, in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to give you a brief overview of the reactions, the Islamic reactions to modern science once people started to realize what's going on. So this is in the 70s, 70s and 80s of, of uh, the 20th century. So this took a while for people to realize, okay, wait a minute, now we are dealing with a different type of science, aren't we? This is not the science of our old you know, masters of the Islamic civilization. And so there were these three main schools that appeared. Uh, one of them, I will present each one in one slide to give you a, a general flavor of the types of reactions very different one from the other. There is one called sacred science, um, which refers to itself as Islamic science. There is another one called ethical science, also refers to itself as Islamic science. And then there is universal science, Abdul Salam, whom I'll mention later, first Nobel Prize, first Muslim to receive the Nobel Prize in the sciences in physics, 1979. Then there is this Ijaz, and those of you who know Arabic, and maybe those of you who don't know Arabic also are familiar with this word, uh, a 
hugely problematic new development. I'll mention that briefly later. And then there is this new generation of voices which has appeared in the last 15, 20 years. And I unhumbly put myself among those. Um, but we'll see what that means. This is Sayyid Hussein Nasr, an Iranian philosopher uh, of science and religion who has lived in the US for the past, what, 40 years or so. Um, one of the most famous Muslim philosophers has written, I don't know, 60 or 70 books, and maybe 500 articles or something. Anyway, um, has brought out this school called Sacred Science, where he insists that modern science is actually an anomaly. And he says, guys, don't, don't worry too much. This modern science is just sort of a teenage phase. It'll go away later. Uh, why is it such a, an anomaly and a phase? He says, because in human history, we have never done science disconnected from God. So this is just, you know, like a teenager, and I've had teenagers, so I know. Uh, they will rebel at some point against one idea or another, and then they will later sort of soften a little bit and come back. So this, this is Sayyid Hussein Nasr. And he says, this is where many people disagree with him, including myself. He says, you cannot do science in disconnect from the rest of all spirits and spirituality, which is the antithesis of the methodological naturalism that I mentioned earlier. So he says, you cannot discuss phenomena in nature without including in your considerations the spirit, the angels, God, etc., etc. And he says, I'm sorry, I, I will not. Uh, so we can come back to this if you want to hear more. Um, so for example, and by the way, he's a Sufi also, grandmaster of Sufism. And he says, actually science uh, should not only proceed through experimentation and you know, the methodology that I mentioned that was actually developed from Ibn al-Haytham and before. Uh, he says, we can get truths from mystical exercises. I can just sit here and contemplate and receive some truths. And that should be a valid source of knowledge. You cannot tell me where is the experiment, where is the proof for this. And so he rejects the objectives of modern science. He says, yeah, confirmation by repeating um, and by accuracy, etc." cetera. And he says that that's not important. What's important, he says, what's important is meaning, purpose, beauty, harmony. That's what we need to get from science, not how accurate is the result and how much your prediction fits with the experimental results. Then there is this Islamization school, Al-Faruqi, Al-Attas, Al-Alwani, etc., which um, emerged in the late 1970s, has essentially disappeared, except maybe in, not maybe, except definitely in Malaysia. I go to Malaysia and I love Malaysia. And uh, Malaysian universities are still very much in love with this Islamization of knowledge, uh, including, to some extent, Islamization of science. So what is this? They say we need to repackage, rewrite, filter all of the knowledge and science that humanity has produced until now through the Islamic prism. And what works, what fits, we'll take and we we'll say, okay, this is correct. What doesn't fit or doesn't work, then we'll set it aside. And obviously that cannot work because science is, we will say later, or at least I believe, is objective and universal. Um, this is Zia Sardar, uh, who is a, essentially a commentator, a writer, has written on everything, including science and philosophy and future, futurism, and etc., etc. And in the 70s and 80s, uh, led a group of thinkers, Muslim thinkers, called the Ijmalis, uh, where they saw some flaws in modern science. And they said the flaws are of two kinds. One is they said, obviously, in the practice of science, in the results of science, there's a huge problem. Because, look, we've had nuclear bombs, we've had the ecological and environmental disasters, we've had you know, all kinds of problems, and look what this modern science has done and what it has led to. It's because you let it develop that way. You need to rein it in from the start. And so how do we rein it in from the start? He said, because... Uh, from the beginning, the principles upon which modern science needs to function 
have to be ethical in the Islamic sense. So how, what do you mean ethical in the Islamic sense? He says, it has to be guided by the uh, principles such as the Islamic principles of uh, Tawheed, divine unity, Khilafah, human trusteeship on earth, uh, knowledge and worship, justice, public interest, maslaha, etc., etc. That group has disbanded a long time ago. It hasn't produced any of what it wanted to produce. Um, and we may debate whether there is any value to what they said. I think that there is some importance in the idea of injecting and imposing some ethical principles into, into science from the start. But that's a different uh, story. This is Muhammad Abdus Salam, the Nobel Prize winner in physics, a genius by any definition of the word. Um, a devout and rationalist Muslim. He insisted that science is universal. He says, what is this Islamic science? Everybody now comes up with some new idea and says, oh, Islamic science. Um, in fact, in this statement that I quote here verbatim from one of his writings, he says, there is no Islamic science, just like there is no Chinese, Indian, Hindu, or Jewish science. So we need to stop this. He says science is actually the same for everybody, no matter what you believe. He says in the applications and practices, there are obviously some cultural, sociological um, aspects to it, but in how we discover things, in how we do experiments, in how we come up with new theories, etc. Okay, I am human, and what I think, and what theory I tend to lean toward in the morning compared to the, in the evening, that depends on my mood and my temperature. But in the end, we need to uh, uh, peer review, we need to check with each other. So I could come up with any ideas, and obviously we are all biased, but in the end, science has this um, you know, checks and balances embedded in it, and has this peer reviewing, which is extremely important that most people don't, don't appreciate very much. And for this, he was labeled as a conventionalist, a modernist, universalist, a business as usual guy. And he said, of course, this guy, he spent, you know, 80% of his life in, in, uh, in Europe, so what do you expect? But that's obviously unfair. Uh, Ijaz is, is this miraculousness. The word Ijaz means miraculousness. In this case, it means scientific miraculousness of the Qur'an, and lately, in the last 20 years or so, people have added, even in the hadiths, the statements of the Prophet. Meaning what? Meaning that if you look carefully, according to them, then you will find numerous statements that if you just understand correctly, you will find lots of scientific content in there. And so this was another reaction uh, to well, you, if you are all very impressed with modern science, don't be, because actually it's all in our book anyway. Uh, and even our prophet, who was uh, illiterate, uh, made lots of, lots of statements that actually contain lots of science. And this has become a huge, huge problem. Cultural, educational, uh, you cannot believe how much time I spend, you know, uh, arguing with people about the very principle itself, the examples that they bring up, but there's, you know, there's a huge momentum to this. There's a huge funding for it. There's a huge popularity. People love to hear this stuff. There's conferences everywhere. You can see at least a partial list, and I could, you know, fill the whole slide with lists of conferences that have been organized on this. And that's another deeply flawed reaction to trying to relate modern science to Islam. So I'll jump on this. You can come back to that. And this is the way I have proposed that Islam can be correctly related to modern science. First of all, modern science, at least in whatever is rigorous in its methodology and results, have to be adopted. We cannot just pick and choose and we cannot you know, place ourselves as the judging party or the arbiters and say, oh, this I like, I'll take. This I don't like. No. Anything that is rigorous and uh, proven, confirmed, universally, we have no choice but to adopt. Because this is nature, this is the world. It's not me or you. That's one. But that has all kinds of consequences, including evolution, for example. So I tell people, I say, listen, hey, before we discuss where is Adam and what does it mean and how did God relate to all this, 
Is evolution scientifically proven, yes or no? That's the first principle that we need to check. If it is proven and correct, then we go back and try to interpret or try to discuss okay, philosophically, theologically, what does it mean? But we cannot put our philosophical and theological principles ahead of the scientific process. Now, for religious people and Muslims, obviously, add an optional theistic interpretive, interpretative mental, meaning once we have done the science, and we can be from all kinds of cultural and religious backgrounds, but we will reach the same conclusions um, in the scientific results. Once we do that, then I must be uh, allowed, I must be given the right to interpret it theistically any way I like. And I also give the right to non-theists, atheists, to interpret it any way they like. So there's an interpretation that comes afterward. I believe, I'm a Muslim, I'm a, I'm a believer, I believe that if I give it the theistic interpretation with the entire uh, worldview, the entire epic, and how the grand cosmic plan, etc., for me it all makes sense, including with the rest of my life and my personal and social life, etc., etc. But if somebody else says, I don't need that, I can make sense of all this, and I can relate to it on a personal level and on a cultural level, and I say, fine. Um, universally impose stringent ethical standards like those of Islam, not necessarily those that Sardar and the Ijmalis proposed, but some ethical principles, I believe, need to be imposed. Otherwise, then we start having all kinds of monstrous work done in the name of science, and that has to be reined in. Uh, and then accept the Qur'an's guidance and philosophy of knowledge. Uh, this I develop quite a bit in, in my book. And I explain, okay, so what do we learn from the Qur'an in terms of what is knowledge, what is epistemology, how are we to approach the world, how are we to learn, what is the place of revelation, what is the place of rational knowledge, etc., etc. So there is a way to put all of that together, and I propose that that can be put in including make strong usage of the, the practice, let's call it, of hermeneutics, this interpretation or more free interpretation of the scriptures. So I come to my conclusion. Um, how do we go forward with this? Well, until recently, as you saw, we've had in the 70s and 80s what I call the first generation of Muslims that tried to contend with uh, modern science uh, and most of them failed. Most of them did not pro produce anything useful. We are still debating and disagreeing, and most of the general public is completely lost, actually. And so we have a task. There's been a second generation, slightly older than me, Mehdi Golshani in Iran, Muzaffar Iqbal from Pakistan in Canada now for the last couple of decades, rare and not very impactful. And then there's this new generation that has appeared lately. And there have been some interesting contributions. There are some disagreements. There are quite a few disagreements among these. Uh, and as I say in the conclusion in the last line, they are scattered and heterogeneous. There's no school that has emerged. So we don't have, we don't have one general paradigm or framework and we say, okay, let's develop our discourse like this and present it to the Muslim world and to the wider world as to how Islam or religion can and should relate to modern science. So this is what I try to do. And uh, as I said, I am a bit shameless in plugging my books, but uh, <laughs> if you read French, these are the two that appeared past couple of years. And if you read English, then there's that. If not, I invite you to consult that website, which is in three languages, in Arabic and English and French, and has tons of material. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It was really very interesting. Uh, I have two requests. Okay. Number one, uh, can you tell us how can you reconcile Religion, any religion, not only Islam, but any religion, and 
uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. Because evolution doesn't recognize a God. Does not what? Doesn't recognize a God. Like evolution has oh. no purpose. And it just happens through natural selection. So oh. it doesn't recognize the existence of a God. Oh. And the other? So, the other one is uh, what happened to Islam? Why are we seeing this decline? Mm. Yeah. What happened? Thank you. Yeah, so you're inviting me to come back for another lecture. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the first question, of course, I get that all the time, even from my students, very often. And then I tell them, where is God when we describe planetary motions or when we describe the evolution of the solar system or the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang and forward? Where is God? Where is he? Um, there's, is there a purpose to the planetary orbits? Is there a purpose to how, how the moon was formed and how it recedes from us by four centimeters every year, etc.? Is there a purpose? Uh, I don't think purpose is embedded in the science. And, and that's why I said at the end, I said there is a religious interpretation that, that can be added afterwards. And we say, oh, so if now I conceive of this as God put in this big plan which unfolded and evolved, um, became more complex. The world clearly became more complex as it went. Clearly, it took some time for life to emerge, for intelligence to appear, for consciousness to develop, etc., etc., for technology and so forth. Uh, so I don't think we can say evolution does not have a God because astronomy doesn't have God either. And uh, geology doesn't have God. Where is God in the uh, plate tectonics and etc., etc.? So, the purpose or the meaning or how is God related to all of this, there needs to be an interpretive effort to be added. So, and I granted, I said earlier, I said evolution, I can certainly see why people find it a bit disconcerting uh, because so we actually emerge from this long evolution of life which, you know, with all kinds of deaths and destructions and uh, species disappearing and others appearing, etc., etc., and then there's you know, sort of seemingly random, seemingly random, but in the end there is this progression, there is this evolution, there is this complexification, and in the end we emerge. Now, keep in mind that we only know one small corner of the universe. So we don't know what has, what has happened and what has appeared elsewhere. Maybe things appeared much earlier elsewhere. By the way, we're very recent. I mean, our, our Earth is only four and a half billion years compared to 13.8. So, very likely, most astronomers believe um, there are some other planets with life elsewhere that appeared 10 billion years ago uh, or more. So, we can't just say, well, why did God make humans appear only at the end? As many people say when they object to evolution. So, you're saying God launched this whole thing and then waited and it took like, 13.7 billion years for anything of interest to start appearing on Earth. I say, no, that's not, that's not what we're saying. We're saying this is what happened on Earth. But maybe something else happened elsewhere. I'm not saying it must, I'm saying maybe. Plus, I, I, get this, I have this discussion with my son all the time, and I, keep, I have to keep reminding him. My son, by the way, is a, is a biology student, and I don't have a problem. Well, he doesn't have a problem with evolution, but he has a problem conceptualizing, okay, how does God relate to all this? Uh, and I tell him, you have to keep in mind that God is not tied to our chronology. God is not in time. God is outside of all space-time. And so for him, everything is happening sort of instantly, you know, in his mind, in his infinite mind. So it's not like, oh, he had to wait 13.7 billion years and then stuff started to occur. So this, this is why I said, I really think this cosmic evolution, um, physical evolution, Biological evolution, etc., forces us to make our conception of the world and of God more sophisticated. Well, we can discuss, we can continue later, I, I just don't want to carry on forever. Let, let me just have a, try to have a stab at the second, at the second question. Um, I think what happened is um, we closed, literally or figuratively, the gates of Ishtihad, the gates of intellectual effort. Uh, actually, just before the lecture with uh, uh, one of my student friends from, from Sharjah, actually from the other University of Sharjah, 
And I said, the problem with the Muslim intellectual history, recent intellectual history, is that it stopped innovating. It stopped producing new ideas, including in religion, including in philosophy, including in sociology. And so it's whatever we received from the great, great minds of five or 10 centuries ago, that's the knowledge. It's like canon. You take it and you pass it on. And I said, that's when it stopped. And if we, what we need is really to reopen, reignite this intellectual effort, this ishtihad. Uh, if we do that, then we'll be much better off. I thank you for a wonderful talk. I appreciate it very much. Um, I had a few questions, but I think I might just stick to one. Okay. Um, which stringent ethical standards would you, um, would you say should be imposed to reach that, that kind of, um, I guess, uh, harmony, harmonizing proposal? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, one ethical principle is, um, is a bit difficult to define, but I carry it and I, it keeps haunting me or coming back to me, and that is the issue of dignity. Dignity for uh, human life and for life more generally. This is one. Two, uh, I, maybe because I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist and I get more impressed with biological stuff, which I consider to be very complex, too complex for me, I have a huge admiration and awe for life, any life, any type of life. And actually once I gave a talk and I said, what we need to develop in Islam, excuse me, what we need to develop is uh, a new principle there are these objectivist maqasidi principles in the Islamic tradition uh, where uh, respect for life or respect for human life, etc. And I said, what we need to do is to generalize this to respect for all life, all kinds of life. So just briefly, those, those are such ethical principles that we need to make sure we do not violate when we do our science. And I, because I think the reason why I picked these two uh, is because I think most people have said that the 21st century is going to be the century of biology. And now with you know, all, all kinds of research, and you heard maybe just, I think, two, three days ago, Craig Venter has now manipulated some bacteria and has sort of reduced it to the minimal set of genes. Uh, so now we're going to be, we're going to be manipulating life, uh, and, and we need to be very, very careful how, how we deal with life. Life is not you know, some little uh, piece of matter that we can cut and, and work with. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your talk. Um, regarding this, uh, you, um, your, your, um, your lesson reminded me of uh, um, one time when Imam uh, Muhammad Mutwali Sharawi, Allah Yerhamu, talked about uh, the... Uh, he addressed this issue in the Islamic world, how people were rejecting uh, evolution and all that and he said you know that if people are looking for ways to reconcile Islam with science but he said no it's the other way around we should find ways to uh, to reconcile Islam uh, science with Islam because and, and he cited also an example where a convert who uh, read uh, Islam back in the 18th century in, in the UK um, he read the, uh, the verse where um, the Quran describes how when a man goes up in the sky, his chest becomes, you know, very thick. And um, he said that, you know, that is an example of how Islam is, as, uh, becomes from, from being a source to being something where it guides rather the principles of ethics, basically, rather than being something that people use and use to try to define science itself. And I was wondering, what do you think of using Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think this needs some clarification. I think we need to be careful because it can mean two very different things, and one of them can be quite good, and one of them could be quite dangerous. The quite good is what you alluded to at the end when you said the ethical guidelines or directives that uh, if you relate science to religion or to Islam or to the Quran or to religious books or whatever, in the sense of finding ethical guidance, uh, then that's perfectly good. There's no problem with that. Um, although, of course, every society has to have a consensus as to what kind of ethics. And I think today we are in such a globalized world that we need to develop universal ethics. 
Um, but if it means, as uh, sometimes is meant, that you look into the scriptures, the Quran or other, and by the way, this is not just limited to the, to the Islamic world, and we find this in, 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 in other cultures, uh, that to find some guidance for the science itself, uh, how, and I've heard this from some people that I, whose names are very famous, but I don't want to mention them, who say, oh, actually, if you read the Quran, it will tell you which cosmological model is actually a correct one. And I say, no, it doesn't. First of all, it doesn't. And that's only your reading of it. And thirdly, you can convince me all you want, all day long. It will not advance science one iota, because science will say, show me the strong evidence, the material evidence, the observations, and the, and the measurements, and the experiments, etc., etc. So trying to find confirmation or guidance or directives to the science from the Quran or other book is, is the wrong way to go. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, many people argue that a lot of what is mentioned or what is discovered only in the 21st century in modern science had already been referred to in the Quran over a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So what is your position on that and how do you think that relates to the mutual exclusivity of science and religion? Yeah, th this is the ijaz that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if I can just go back to this slide just to give you a few examples of that here. Um, I have a whole chapter on that. I, I, I hate to keep going back to my book, but uh, I have a whole chapter on that where I review the principles that are used by the proponents of this, of this school. And I review the examples that they give, including the, one of the most famous examples. And that is that the speed of light can be derived to something like seven digit accuracy from just verses of the Quran. And you can find it, you know, I mean, it's a very famous example, very stunning one. I remember when, I still remember to this day when one person told me, I said, you don't believe? Because I was like, are you serious? <laughs> he said, you don't believe? I'll bring you the paper tomorrow. Um, anyway, and it, and it took me a few hours to go over that thing, you know, step by step. And it's, the moon goes around the earth, and then there is this radius, and then there is, okay, so this distance is calculating from the time it takes to do this, and you have to go over it, and then you, you find that it is wrong, <laughs> mathematically wrong. Uh, or at, at least it is, um, it is flawed. He tricks it in the middle. So to make a long story short, the principles that are used, that are proclaimed, are wrong, and the principles that are proclaimed by the proponents of this school are actually not used by the proponents of this school. And the examples that they give, I have challenged people all around me to bring me one example that I could not uh, reject you know, by clear, clear review. So, no, it's, it's, it's wrong in every manner. I mean, I could... Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question towards the end when you alluded to science as being objective. Mm. And I wanted to know what your thoughts are with regards to someone like Rupert Sheldrake, oh. who's written a book called The Science Delusion, mm -hmm. and whose view is, is that um, following the views of other philosophers, such as Daniel Dennett, who says there's no such thing as philosophy free science, is that modern science in its trajectory in the West was founded on a kind of secular materialism as a reaction to the excesses of the church. Mm. And in fact, as a result of that, it methodologically can never account for other than the supernatural. And what's happening now is that good science is inverting bad science. So the subatomic level, the quantum level, we're finding things that are inverting the presumptions of objectivity or determinism and reductionism by, for example, the non-localization, a, a negation of the observer effect, and so on, so on. So I'm, I'm just quoting Rupert okay, Sheldrake yeah, here. I can see and, and how that um, ties in to the Islamicization project, because uh, the original Islamicization project had the same assumptions. And there were two schools. Ismail Farouk is mechanistic, and Abbas is more epistemological. Mm -hmm which actually I think is common to your point. Your point four is about going back to epistemology. So is that not another adv advocacy for an Islamicization, albeit maybe not with the same errors that happened before? Thank you. Uh, let me start with the last one, just so I, I not be misunderstood. No, my point was 
in order to harmonize, and I said it's a harmonizing uh, uh, proposal, eh? in order to harmonize, I, I said we can go back to the epistemology of the Quran, so how do we get knowledge and what does it mean that we get knowledge from here or from there, and in harmonizing we make use of hermeneutics. So I'm not saying there is any Islamization of the knowledge itself, just so we be clear. Now, uh, I think in what you said, by the way, Rupert Sheldrake, what he says essentially is, you have gone too fast with the methodological naturalism principle. You have left out or decided to leave out anything that relates to spirit or spirituality, anything that we cannot account for by physical processes, and you're saying that does not exist. This is what Rupert Sheldrake says, essentially, in his book. Yeah? I have it on, on my bedside, by the way. Yeah. Not that I agree with him, but, okay, interesting book and an and important uh, contribution. He does not, he, he, yeah, and he does use the word materialistic, which I think is, is the jump that he makes too fast. There's a difference between naturalistic and materialistic. Science, science does not say you have to be materialistic and you have to reject God and you have to reject spirit. It does not. It just says the physical phenomena that we see around us can and must be uh, described and explained using natural causes and reasons. And then we say, yeah, how do you know that everything can be accounted for like that? How do you know? And Rupert Sheldrake goes to great lengths in trying to find examples from India, from that you know, village up in the mountain where I found somebody who hasn't eaten for like 40 years. And how do you explain that, and things like that? And I say, that's why I mentioned earlier the big principle of peer review in science. Somebody can relate to me some extraordinary uh, um, story or relation, or, or, uh, sorry, or phenomenon, or practice, or whatever, until it has been checked by many others in many different contexts, etc. And then we say, this clearly violates the principle, this cannot be explained, then everybody will be happy to say, wait, wait, let's backtrack. But to my knowledge, and I follow science quite closely, we haven't found a single example where it is internationally, let's say, diversely agreed that there's a problem with this phenomenon, it cannot be explained. Uh, now, of course, people will cling to this localization of quantum mechanics, um, What is this localization of quantum mechanics? It is when you have two particles that have been in interaction at some point, and then you bring them apart very far away, far enough where uh, transmission of any signal exceeds what light speed allows, then if you make a measurement over here, automatically you are affecting the measurement over here. And that is an extraordinary phenomenon that we still have not completely understood. We know how to describe it, we know how to measure it in the lab, but we have not quite understood. So how is this relation between the two? How do they keep, it's just like two twins who haven't seen each other for 10 years, and then somebody is sick and the other feels like something has happened to my brother. Um, but why does that necessarily imply there is some spirituality or there is something not naturalistic, not materialistic? And I'll just say this last statement because I do want to hear from as many people as, as possible. Um, we have to be very careful not to jump to certain conclusions uh, such as naturalism is, is, is in difficulty or something like that, as Rupert Sheldrake does. Because in the past, we have, been, we have been burned very often in coming up with whatever explanation you know, suits us best, and we run with it, and then somebody comes up with a new explanation or a new experiment and says, see, I can explain it for you now. Huh? What do you do with your old story? And then we look like fools. So thanks very much for the really fantastic question, but uh, it, we have to be careful with that. So, uh just a, a comment, obviously as a Muslim and a scientist, I agree with you fully, you know, that there is no conflict between what science has established and what we believe as, uh, as Muslims. And the Quran itself um, makes the claim that in this book you will not find any mistakes. So you will not find something uh, which has been 
contradicted by what science has established as fact. For example, the Earth is flat or you know, those kinds of things. And in relation to human evolution, um, religious, some religious scholars of Islam will say that here you, the description given of the creation of man in the Quran, the creation of Adam in the Quran, is not in agreement with what human evolutionary science uh, mm -hmm. is saying. Um, so how would you deal with that specific yeah. point? Okay, um, <clears throat> you know that to this day there are people who argue from uh, verses in the Quran that the sun goes around the earth. You know or not? Know you know that? It's not true. <laughs> ah, it's not true. How do you know that it's not true? You see? Uh oh, why? But you know, people understood it that way for centuries and centuries. But now for us it's like, it's obvious that the verses don't say that. Why is it obvious? It says, the sun rises and the sun sets and the sun goes to a resting place, etc. Huh? And people understood it like, okay, of course, and we see the sun going around us and the, the, God says in the Quran, etc. To this day, there are religious scholars who say, no, according to the Quran, the sun goes around the earth. Why? Because they stick to this old reading, literalistic reading, and they are stuck with it. Luckily, 98-99% of all Muslims have moved on, have understood that there is so much proof that the sun is the center of the solar system at least, and the earth goes around, around it, and that these verses are not to be taken as simplistically as such, and they have to be understood a little bit better, and so we move on. Likewise, um, if there is, I said earlier, I said, when we go to evolution, we first ask how much scientific evidence is there for it. And I've told people, look, I teach astronomy, okay? There is a lot more evidence for evolution than there is evidence for the Earth going around the sun. Can you believe that? That's an extraordinary statement for an astronomy professor to make, right? Uh, so if there is that overwhelming amount of evidence, then you go back and you say, oh, there have been a number of uh, statements in the Quran that have been reinterpreted, understood, actually interpreted in different ways from the start. From the start. Uh, and so um, maybe this will help us understand this a little bit differently and better. Um, and um, as I said, I have, trust me, I have contended with that question. I mean, coming to terms with Islam, the Quran, evolution, the cosmos, etc., is not something that can be resolved in one hour.